Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with fabulous concert programs number 42, and also, yes, at 42 it is, and number four of our Mendelssohn Symphony cycle. And of course, Mendelssohn's Fourth Symphony is his most popular. It's the Italian Symphony. It's so familiar, it's so charming, it's so light and vivacious that we forget what a remarkable work it is. First of all, its scoring is exquisite. It really is the opening, the very opening chord. You can tell what symphony it is from the opening note, that pizzicato, plunk, and then the woodwind's going, tat, 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 tat. you don't even have to hear the tune. You know, Mendelssohn, Italian symphony. And then the finale, which is a Saltarello slash Tarantella type thing. I can't even do it, it's so quick. It's amazing. It's a major key symphony that ends in the minor key. That is unbelievably rare. Incredibly rare. And it sounds perfectly normal, of course, because it's it's a dance, even though it's it's a, a, a minor key dance, but that's the kind of dance it is. It's an ethnic thing. It's not a tragic, you know, sort of thing at all, not in the least bit. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I've done a program I, I couldn't resist, a program which is entirely about Italy by non-Italians. I always think that's fun. It's so much fun to hear how, how other people do these things. And so the first half consists of Berlioz, the Roman Carnival Overture, um, which is, you know, the Roman Carnival Overture. It's music from his opera Benvenuto Cellini, which he turned into this absolutely brilliant, dazzlingly delightful overture, um, which makes, oh, it's such a perfect car car curtain raiser. I mean, I've played it that way. I've seen it done a dozen times that way. It's, it's just ideal. Then Mendelssohn, the Italian symphony, which really has a first half piece because it's a very short symphony. It's actually, it's like 25 minutes long, depending on whether you take the exposition repeat in the first movement, and you should. It's a wonderful repeat because Mendelssohn wrote a big, long lead back to the opening. And if you don't take the repeat, then you miss a whole pile of music. And it's good music. So I, I like it. It gives the piece a little bit more substance, I think. But some people don't do it. I, you can't argue with it one way or another. It's just fantastic. And so the Italian symphony brings the house down in time for intermission. And after intermission, we have another double bill. Um, in this case, in this case, we have Schubert's Overture Number no. One in the Italian style. There are two of them, both in the Italian style. What was the Italian style? Well, the Italian style, when Schubert was writing his overtures in the Italian style, was Rossini. Rossini had taken Vienna by storm. He was all the rage. His opera that he wrote for Vienna, Semiramide, was like, people were going mad for it. Beethoven was very pissed because everyone wanted to hear Rossini's stuff and they didn't want to hear Beethoven's stuff, particularly Beethoven's opera, Fidelio. So, so the Schubert overtures of the Italian style are in the way of probably you would might say affectionate parodies of the Italian style, meaning simple tunes, simple accompaniments, lots of internal repetition, and they're delightful. And no one knows them. It's kind of fascinating. You know, it's not like Schubert wrote tons of orchestral music. I mean, he didn't. You know, I mean, there's lots of bits and fragments and, you know, and the completed symphonies and, and overtures to his theatrical works and whatnot. But basically, that's about it. And then you have these two lovely little overtures, and they should be better known. So that makes a wonderful curtain raiser. And I've actually played one of them, and I've seen them played. So, uh, you know, a couple times. And, and they're, they're, they're just wonderfully delightful works. And then, as the piece de résistance, a rarity, Richard Strauss's Aus Italien. It's a four-movement tone poem thing, but it's four separate movements. It's as big as a symphony. Um, it uses the tune Finiculi, Finicula in the finale. That was, I've talked about that before. It was a, a famous copyright lawsuit that Richard Strauss was shocked when he found out that it wasn't a folk tune. And he said, you mean somebody wrote that? And somebody did. It was Luigi Denza, and he was teaching at the Royal Academy in London, voice, of course. And he sued Richard Strauss, who was a big, you know, composer's rights copyright person. <laughs> And he must have been totally, totally flabbergasted when that happened. But Alice Italian is a beautiful work. 
It doesn't get played because it's just not a later work. It's not one of the famous tone poems like Death and Transfiguration or Till Eulenspiegel or Also Sprach Zaratustra. You know, it's more conservative. Um, it's more along the lines of like Liszt, that style, um, but it's still fabulously orchestrated and wonderfully tuneful and moody and atmospheric. And, oh my God, the first movement is just gorgeous. Oh my word, it's so beautiful. It's sort of a pastoral country thing. It's magnificent. It's a beautiful piece. It deserves to be played. It deserves pride of place in a concert, along with Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony. And when you put it all together, you have a wonderful Italian fest by foreigners, people who never set foot there. <laughs> well, some of them did. Some of them did, but most of them didn't spend a lot of time in Italy and didn't even have a lot of respect for Italy, but they all wrote Italian works. And that's what's so marvelous about this program. I hope you give it a shot and hear all the different styles by which these different composers realized the Italianisms. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.